folks, this is Kurt Nabig from Acting Studio Chicago, here to talk to you about monologues. Monologues, the bane of a lot of actors' existence. People wonder, why the heck do we have to do them, and why are they so darn complicated? And ultimately, we get cast to work with another actor. Why do we have to prove our worthiness to work with another actor? By standing in a dark room, talking to a spot on the back wall, and trying to create relationship with a brick, with a wall, with an exit sign. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense, but that's the biz. And it would be silly to complain. It'd be like the hockey player saying, I would be so good if it just weren't for the puck. That's the deal. One of the things people ask all the time is, how do I pick a monologue? I'm so afraid that I'm gonna pick the wrong thing. First of all, let me put your mind at ease. There is no perfect monologue. You're not going to find a monologue that leaps from the page and fuses to your soul and suddenly helps you achieve monologue nirvana. It's not there. Really, what we want to see when you come in the room is for you to do something that is maybe charming, easy, shows us a little bit about you, and that you leave without making it feel like a stressful situation for you or for us. So that means when you're looking for a monologue, you may want to stay away from anything that feels like it's a, a cathartic moment or a piece in which you have to cry halfway through the monologue and you're stressed about doing that throughout. You just want to find something that you can do well, even on a crappy day. Where do I look for a monologue? Well, I'd advise against using monologue books unless you're okay with being the fourth person doing that monologue on this particular day. Also, you may want to stay away from recent Pulitzer Prize winners and big hits of the last couple of seasons. You won't be the only person doing that monologue. But gosh, there are so many other places to look. And if you want something no one else has seen, maybe try looking at anthologies of short plays, one acts or 10 minute plays. These are great sources. They're often pretty compact and no one else has seen them. And you can usually find them by looking around on eBay, your local library or um, Amazon. I've also found over the years, there are a lot of great plays coming out of Australia and Canada. Playwrights we don't think to look for. Writers who sound very much like American contemporary writers and yet are rarely produced in America. And you can do them without a risk that a lot of other people are doing the same piece. Okay, so now you have your monologue and it's time to get to work. What do I do? Well, the first thing I recommend most people do is get out your phone, open up your voice memos, and make a recording of what your monologue is spoken at about the rate of speed you expect to do it when you do that piece in front of people. Generally, we recommend that a monologue be a minute to a minute and a half in length. And a lot of times I'll tell my students have two separate cuttings of that monologue dependent upon the audition. You're going to listen back to that recording after you're done and hear if it's too long or if it's too fast. You should have a pretty good sense of, of this when you give it a listen. If it's too long the way that you've spoken it, go back, re-record it at about the rate of speed that you think you will do it and then take a look at your timing. If that piece runs too long, now's the time that you have to cut. I know it hurts, but you gotta do it. Generally, I would recommend you start at the top or the back end of your piece and just lop off a section. It's much easier to do that than to go internally and cut lines or words out of the piece, hoping that you're gonna buy yourself some time. It can, it sometimes doesn't work well, and on top of that, sometimes it can lead you to having a piece that doesn't quite make sense. So now you're ready. Now we move on to the fun part, performing the monologue. Now, as you start working toward performance of this piece, there's a few things you want to be thinking about. Who am I talking to? What do I want from them? How am I going to get it? When you look at your piece, you want to be clear about the relationship that you're in with the person you're hypothetically speaking to. So rather than choosing, I'm talking to a five foot, 10 inch guy with brown hair, much more interesting if I choose my own brother. I'm speaking to my brother who I love, but is a total flake. And every time I try to help him get his life together, he cracks wise, which makes me laugh. And that just makes me madder. 
You see, now I have love, I have humor, I have history. I've got a bunch of things that are much more interesting to watch in a monologue situation. Next thing you want to pay attention to is what are my actions? And I don't mean movements, although actions may be movements. I'm talking about tactics or verbs. You see, as you work through your piece, you should be just as clear about the words as you are about those actions or verbs. So you should know in my piece, my opening action is to joke with my partner. And then my next action is to reason with them. And then I discover they don't get it. So I berate them for being stupid. And then I realize, oh my God, I hurt their feelings and I want to beg their forgiveness. Okay, so at this point, you should know what your actions are and what your discoveries are throughout the piece as well as you know your lines. So that you're no longer walking into a room thinking, geez, I hope this goes well. You're walking into a room saying, I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly how I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna make this happen. Something I haven't talked about yet, though, is tops and bottoms of your monologue. Meaning, you need to start extremely strongly and you need to finish really strongly. These are the moments we remember the most. So at the top, after you find your imaginary partner on the back wall, and they should exist at about eye level on the back wall when you're standing up, right? After you find them, you need to know what discovery it is you're receiving from them, what it is they did, said, or the look that they gave you that compels you to do your first action. So your piece should begin with the breath of discovery leading into your first action. We see people all day start monologues in a, in a fashion that looks a little bit like this. Hey, I wish you would cut that out, right? And then the 10th person walks in and they go, Hey, I wish you would cut that out. And we respond because they breathed in like a humanoid. They seemed to be fully in relationship with another person. And what we're looking at feels like truth as we know it. So be clear about your opening action. And then finally, when you get to the last line of your piece, it's really important that you hold in place for about three seconds as you finish the last line. I'll show you what doesn't work. If somebody, if the last line of your piece is, and that's what I have to say to you, this is what you don't want to do. And that's what I have to say to you. Thank you. You also don't want to do this. And that's what I have to say to you. Right? It doesn't feel like it's finished. Really, what you want to do is finish, land it, and hold in place for about three seconds. And that's what I have to say to you. Thank you. And then you can leave the room. It's simple, it's clear, and it feels like it's finished. Something I want to remind you all of is the fact that your audition begins the moment you enter the building in which that audition is going to take place. Meaning, treat people the way you would like to be treated. There's usually a room monitor or somebody who's checking you in along the way. If you treat that person poorly, chances are at some point in time the director's going to say to them, Hey, Anybody who was a jerk today, anybody who was a problem out there in the lobby, and those people are usually pretty apt to uh, confide in the director who was a jerk. If that happened to be you, chances are you're not going to get cast in the thing that you were hoping to get cast in. We know if somebody can't treat people nicely for the few minutes it takes to do an audition, they're probably going to be a problem in the process of doing this show. <music> Another thing, sometimes people say, should I use props? Can I bring a prop to my audition? Well, let me begin with this. Hi, my name is Kurt Nabig, and I will be playing Billy from Streamers. What are you thinking about right now? What is this dude going to do with that duster? Exactly. Your audition ostensibly does not begin until we see you use that duster. Don't bring props. They're just not worth it. I used to tell my students, if you had a prop that you could put in your pocket and pull out at the precise moment you needed, like this pen, 
use it and then tuck it away again, that would be fine. I used to say that until I had a pen that I pulled out of my pocket during an audition. It got loose of my hand, flew into the audience, and hit the director. Now, I have to say, as that pen was arcing toward the director, I couldn't help but think, well, that isn't very smart, Kurt, and you teach this. There was a level of humiliation involved, and frankly, I learned my lesson. So I thusly pass it on to you. Don't use props. A lot of people worry, what happens if I do this audition and blow it? Will I ever get an opportunity to work for this theater again? Or will they always remember how bad I was and never call me back? First of all, this is uh, something kind of depressing that may also make you happy. If you blow an audition, generally they won't remember you beyond about 10 minutes after you've left. So while it's sad that you blew the audition, Nobody remembers. You can come on back next year and audition again, and nobody will go, oh my goodness, we shouldn't have them in. They were so bad last year. What we do remember is if you were rude, if you were offensive, if you treated people poorly in the lobby, that's the stuff we remember. Those are the kind of things that will keep you from coming back the following year. If the audition goes really well afterwards, I recommend that you give yourself a pat on the back for just a few minutes and then grab a notepad and start writing down, what did I do right that helped that audition go well today? Write down, it might just be a couple of words, but you wanna keep track of that. You could put it in your phone so that you have it with you everywhere you go. If things go poorly at the audition, rather than beat yourself up for the next two weeks, if you need to, give yourself a good five minute beating, and then pull out that notebook or pull out that phone and write down, what did I do or not do that was unhelpful for me at this particular audition? If you keep track of this and allow yourself to learn from your notes, you will grow at an exponentially faster rate than most other actors. I think most of us go to an audition and if it goes bad, we beat ourselves up for a few weeks and then we start all over again at the next audition. Or if it goes well, we pat ourselves on the back and tell ourselves we're awesome and we don't figure out why that particular audition went so well. Make it your business, your focus, to learn each time you go out and audition. And if you do that, you'll enjoy the process and you will become a much better auditioner over the long haul. And folks, remember when you're auditioning, we get the gift of doing something that we love. So many of our friends wish to do what we do. We're doing it. So go out there, folks, and do it and have fun. <laughs>